Okay, we are at Collective Coffee on February 6th, 2020. Ooh. We have some students ready to ask some questions, so Here fire we go. away. Fire away. All right, my name's Abby Poole, and my question is, what are your thoughts on the behavior of President Trump and House Speaker Pelosi during the State of the Union address? Well, what did Traditional. Very did, this is what did something happen? I <laughs> are you asking if we applaud their behavior? <laughs> Or do we, I mean... Well, mostly do you think Trump's behavior was actually disrespectful, or did he just not see her hand? Oh, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure he saw her. <laughs> um, there are multiple pictures from multiple angles, and I mean, I wasn't there, but obviously, but it looks like he saw her. I, you know, both of them um, probably fell below the standard of decorum that we should expect, but I'm not surprised anymore. As a teacher of American history, um, obviously there have been times where decorum was out the window and people <laughs> tried to kill each other with fire pokers in the Senate chamber and nearly succeeded a few times. Dang near. Um, but it wasn't as public as it is now. We did go, I think post-World War II, we've had some norms and some uh, etiquette and some uh, unsaid traditions that have been pretty consistent over the last 40, 50 years. And you can, you can definitely say Pelosi was childish and petty. But if Trump is not the king of petty, and I'm not saying she's justified just because I don't want to do the whole, well, he did it. So I don't, mm. I mean, I would love to get back to a point where we do have those norms and civil discourse and etiquette and it's not so partisan. I don't know that we're ever going to get back there. We might have lost that for good. Um, so maybe this is just how politics is from both sides. I mean, it's I la if I think about last year when you know she made the 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 when she clapped at him, you remember that whole thing, and so maybe this is just a continuation of that. I I, I thought it was childish in my on both ends of that. So I don't. I mean, he should have shake you know he should shake her hand. It's part of the decorum. Ripping up the speech was that tit was for tat, mistake, I suppose, yeah. but I, I don't see that it served either of them very well. It just brings down the whole process, in my opinion. It, it, I, I wish they would just, you know, do your thing, say what you need to say. You don't have to like each other, but right, I, I don't, I don't see how it helps anybody do anything any better because of the actions on either side. Do you think so. the Democrats are doing this a little bit purposefully because of the whole we, they go low, we go high, Hillary, and it didn't work, and I mean, so now some of them are like, we got to get in the mud. There, I mean, yes. there is that thought, and I, we had, we were talking about this the other day, where you know how. Do you just appease him because he's, you know, a bully and he does things like that? And you just kind of, well, it's okay and we just don't do it. Or do you, at, at some point, do you do you do something too? I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what the I answer is there, but I wonder if that's part of it. I think it, what would be best is if people could call him out for his mistakes, but be able to say good job when he does something that seems to be working. Yeah. I mean... You can talk about the economy, whether these are it's a good, accurate, good measurement, but you know that's not the world we reform. That is whatever. not the world we live in. Exactly. You know that. So. Well, but look, this was politically calculated by Pelosi because if you can see or you can see at the State of the Union, there's a moment where she she pulls the speech below the desk to see if she can rip it. Oh. And then she rips it. And so look, this oh, is so she had planned it out ahead of time. Yeah. Well, oh. during the speech at some point, but look, this is. This is an intentional response from Pelosi. We talked about this in Gov today because he turned the State of the Union into the reality show that he wanted it to be. Right. Uh, there were the surprise moments and the sort of um, recognition moments, the automatic the reuniting. Of the, yeah, and, yeah, and he was trying to make multiple viral moments for his campaign, which he succeeded, but she took the last viral moment. It's all that anyone's talked about since. And it doesn't seem like Pelosi is one to make rash decisions. No. I'm sure this is calculated. She probably has deeply thought about this. This would be a response that she could do if she thought it was appropriate. So I doubt she just did this on impulse. And we'll see. Okay, next question. Hi, my name is Savannah Godwin, and I was wondering, um, even though people are more likely to get the flu, why is the coronavirus getting all the hype? Um, New kid on the block? Because it's 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 coming from a foreign land and it's scary. That's uh, you know I wonder. That's an interesting question because is it any worse than anything else we've seen? The SARS epidemic, and, and I'll put that in quotes. Maybe uh, it it was 
uh, how many years ago was the SARS thing? 20-ish, mm -hmm. I, I guess. Um, sudden acute respiratory syndrome. Swine flu. The swine flu stuff that, that we see, uh, a different avian flus. I don't know. I, I wonder. It's the newest, scariest thing. The, the, the regular old flu that kills people every year, which is should be a big topic, right? Um, it, I, this is, I think because it's a new word and it's and it has the ability to hook people and go, oh my God, it's this new thing to be afraid of because I don't think, I don't think people, most people I know don't necessarily take the flu very seriously, even though they should. Um, I think it's more of just the fear factor, something new. We don't know. It's a little unknown. Yeah, and there's no vaccine against it. You know, how do you, how do you, maybe, yeah. I saw an interview f with someone from the CDC who said they thought the mortality rate could be as high as 3%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but the common flu is like 0.2% or something like that. So yeah. comparatively, I think there's some alarm bells going off. We're, we're not very good at being super logical, and I no. also don't think it's sometimes right to be super logical. For instance, sometimes after a shooting, you have all this, it's terrible, it's horrible, it's, you know, and if five people died, and then somebody could, and somebody did this, tweet that, hey, more people die in car accidents every day, 20 times over, nobody's talking about that. We should do something about road safety, or dying from obesity, or you could name the list. Right. Way more people die from that. But at the same time, you've got to say, well, is it appropriate to say that in the do you, do you think there's an overreaction now with all the super quarantines and they're locking down cities and cruise ship people can't get off the boats? And I mean, do you think that's over? I think there's an overreaction. An overestimation on here? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and the media loves it. I mean, if the world's on fire, they make its ratings for them. Uh, and I'm, I wonder if that's part of it, honestly. Although, you know, it's new and it is concerning because they're not quite sure how to battle it. How easily is it transmitted? How easily is it? Uh, how, how, what, what are the infection rates going to be? I mean, every day it seems like, I mean, I woke up yesterday, and it seemed like it was like 14,000 people that had been officially diagnosed with it. By the end of the night, it was like 20,000. So what are the real numbers? You know, in China, not here in the United States, obviously, but multiple countries are dealing with it. And we do have such fluidity as a global society about how many people travel back and forth, you know, to these different countries. And could you bring a pandemic on? I mean, it is possible, you know. I mean, it is one of the, thing, one of the four or five things that could do a lot of damage very quickly is a virus of some sort. So... It could be scary. But yep. Okay. Excellent. Very good. Next question. Hello. My name is Connor Johnson, and I wanted to ask, uh, so the DNC chairman uh, has just called for re-canvassing in Iowa, and I want to know what your guys' opinion on... Uh, yeah, I mean, the re-canvassing the re is really, um, for the DNC, it's the appearance of we're doing something about it, and that's my opinion. For the um, people in the room who may not know, including me, what does re-canvassing mean? Because <laughs> I haven't heard um, of this. It's either. basically pulling all the raw, the raw data and re-examining results. And look, they have a paper trail because they do preference cards uh, for the first ballot, and then they do realignment. Um, so if you if your candidate wasn't viable, then you go to a candidate who was. So there are paper trails for everything. There's f photo documentation. Every campaign had somebody in every precinct. So it's not going to be re hard to recreate the data. But if I'm understanding the DNC rules accurately, one of the candidates has to call for it. What so. is your personal opinion about the caucus system in Iowa as opposed to traditional voting well, and well just caucusing in general? It's just it's a why, it's why do they do it? <laughs> She's laughing because I hate it. Red Rover, um, Red Rover, <laughs> send Bernie fans over. Everybody <laughs> runs to that. Yeah, well it is. It's grown up Red Rover. Um, look, t for me it's un it's undemocratic. Um, it's peer pressure too. I mean, you got the people staring at you. It's it it takes too long. It it. It drives down participation because people barely go into a primary and, and go into a voting booth and click a, a screen, much ha, less stay How many people can spend all day caucusing? Yeah, it's, I it's mean, really? just not feasible. It seems like that would eliminate most people who might have a voice if we just did a regular primary. Yeah, we have. Is, I that, think is that part of the point, though, is to limit how many people can be participating? I mean, I wonder. Well, I think the point is, is it prejudicial on its face is what I'm asking you. Oh, yeah, I think it is. I think the point is to reward the really enthusiastic campaigns to get a to get a to get a candidate who has a lot of support um, behind them. But uh, real quick, here's something I might have used to know, but I don't now. Why Iowa? Did they win some sort of lottery to go first? I mean, what's the deal every year? I mean, Iowa? Th didn't they just vote? I'm not saying anything bad about Iowa. It's just that every e year they get to go first. But each state gets yeah. to decide when they 
do their primaries, yeah, we right? Take turns. Yeah. So the states theoretically get to decide, but the DNC can do things like strip them of their uh, delegates, like they did in Michigan in 2008. So, uh, okay. um, yeah. But I mean, Iowa goes first because they've traditionally gone first, and I, it's not. It doesn't make sense for the Democrats anymore, mm. to me. Okay. Next it, question. Would, hold on. Would there oh. be a better state to go first, in your opinion? Um. Okay. Or should we all just go at the I'm same? Censoring. Should we all just go at the same time? <laughs> Any other state, but Iowa. I mean, really. <laughs> I mean, Super Tuesday conferences. for everybody. Just all fifty states. Hit it. Like, what's the point of? Yeah, I stretching mean, it out. the the point of the primary system in general is to to weed out the candidates to find n- not only someone who has a lot of enthusiasm, but someone who's electable through a long process. And whoever's running out of money. Well, and that's what it's become. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. I hate these long campaigns. I know that sometimes they can be beneficial, but sure. Boy, we have they drag on forever. Okay. Next question. Hello. Hi, I'm Hayes Horton. So we've been talking a lot about imperialism in AP World and A Push. And so I'd like to know, each of you, what you think the most important factor behind why countries are imperialist is, like economic or political or money, religious, money, money. Yeah. and why you think <laughs> that. We, we, we make a list that, um, I, and I rank the reasons, and I put economics first. I mean, I think without the money factor, who cares? You know, you just have this burning desire to go and, and control other people just because you want to control other people? I mean, without the money, who? why would you go and do that? Why would you bother? So I always put economics first. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think that, and if you're one of the big countries that has the ability to do this, you also have the competition factor. If you don't do it now, you lose the chance forever. I think there was a lot of that within the United States. Where when we talk about the Philippines, if we didn't do it, somebody was going to do Japan. it. Japan. So, hey, it better to us spread American values than... Those crazy values. And when we when we talk about this in Euro, we also, t- it, well, and in world as well, we mentioned the fact that part of the reason the Europeans are scrambling the way they do is because they're after each other at the same time. And if I have more resources and more people, then it solidifies my position, and other countries might not be as quick to come after me. I mean, it, it, so that's, but that oh, that boils back to, I mean, yes, it's political, but it actually boils back down to the economic ability of each state. And think overseas markets, uh, overseas cheap labor, s- this overseas stuff is very important for countries to be in power like us mm-hmm. and it you know it brings up good questions because here we are in 2020 talking about democracy and equality and then you've got a lot of areas controlled by the United States and they don't get to like Puerto Rico or Guam or American Samoa they don't get to send senators they don't they're citizens but not really so it's like second class right. citizenship in 2020 uh, it's just on a weird kind of thing and I don't know you know we talk about that i I'm, of course, I know more about the past imperialism than I do what's currently going on, but it seems like that would be more of an issue as far as American citizenship and what is equal to have, you know, really millions of people around the world that are technically American citizens but don't really get the equal say as other Americans. Mm -hmm. But people in Alaska do or people in Hawaii do, but not, you know, Guam. (laughs) No, no Puerto Rico, no. Yeah, you know, it's kind of weird. I mean, do you, do you have to be a state to be a citizen? No. No. Well, but okay, so why don't we allow them to have more of a voice? Exactly. Supreme Court, Philippines, <laughs> it goes back to the, the Constitution doesn't necessarily follow the flag. We can wave our flag over country, but they don't necessarily get all the rights. We could argue that that happens here inside the That's contiguous right, United yeah. States, that mm-hmm. the rights don't necessarily, are, they're not necessarily equated the way w- we hope that they would be. And that, at least that gets brought up. People yeah. talking about gerrymandering or yeah, right. voter, but no one talks about, hey, maybe Puerto Ricans, and they should have more democracy towards what we're doing. I don't know. Well, is there a, I'm is there a, should, I'm just saying. Is there a chance that they will ever become the 51st state? I don't know. Well, just well, will Puerto Rico number. become a state before California breaks up into multiple states? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't even know that there's even talk about, anybody even talks about this. Well, would they want to? Until they I get senators and representatives to fight for them, I don't know that this will ever be. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Wouldn't it be beneficial, though? Well, I, I mean, I think it would, definitely representationally, but you're going to have to have Congress take an action, and they don't do that at the mm. moment. Ah, yes. And we'd have to go help them in a hurricane and stuff, which we don't do <laughs> True. well. No, paper towels. Paper towels. <laughs> All right, next question. My name is Evan Jordan. Um, so in AP Lang, we're going over a book called The Shallows, and it's about how the internet affects our brains and our ability to focus and read, and in a negative way is what the book claims. And it, my question is, on that note, 
do you think the age of the internet will affect our generations in a point of concern, or is the trade well worth it for the access to the World Wide Web and information online? It's interesting to me that you have all of the world's information at your fingertips, and yet what most people do on their phones is take selfies and, and then put filters on them and TikToks and things. You know, I mean, uh, it's interesting. I don't know. Like, I, I, ha, that's, that's got to be impactful somehow. I get the entertainment value of being online, right? But at the same time, if we're thinking about using it as it was actually intended originally, which was a, which was a fr from an educational standpoint, communication between colleges and whatever, right? Um, I, has, it, has it made us smarter or made us dumb? Has it dumbed us down, you know? I, I guess it just depends on who we're talking about individually. Uh, we're talking about the progressive era and a push, and that whole era was trying to figure out problems. How do you solve huge monopolies, child labor? Uh, the list goes on and on. And I think we're in that world right now with Facebook and social media and trying to figure out how to solve fake news and freedom of speech issues that we've all... Uh, we don't have this figured out. I don't think it's, I think it, the internet is obviously, I think, one of the most important, if not the most important development post-World War II. It's changed the world. It's given information access to millions who would not have it. You have the world at your fingertips. There's good and bad. I don't think we're going to understand this, probably not in my lifetime. It's going to be one of those things looking back 80 years and going, oh, okay, I see what they were doing with Twitter there and they figured that out and, or do, do you think that the ease of access of information has devalued it somehow? Almost like, I mean, in, before, when education was very elitist, people valued it because it was hard to get. Now, it's just, here it is, in, in good, bad, ugly, whatever. I mean, there's bad information out there as well, but still information that you could weed through to figure out for yourself how you feel about things. But it's because it's so easily accessible that people go, meh. I could look it up anytime I wanted to. I don't have to think about it. There it is, right? I wonder, if, I wonder if that's part of it. Anything in great abundance is going to be less valued. It's just economic uh, 101. Mm -hmm. uh, steel, used to, they used to wear it for jewelry because it was valuable. And then Carnegie figured out how to mass produce it. Now we don't even think about it. Yeah. Information is that way now. People used to, uh, I have a book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then Gutenberg comes along, go, book, book, schmuck. Here, everybody, <laughs> take a book. And it created the scientific revolution. I think the internet is going to, I think, once again, I say this a lot, and I still stick with this. If you are born in the year 2000, you're going to see more change if you live a good long life than any human before you. Mark says the, that religion was the opiate of the masses. He never saw the internet. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I, it's, a, it's this weird thing that maybe it keeps, oh, man, this is going to be, mm, maybe it just keeps stupid people in check so that smart people can do what they need to do. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's bread and circuses. Just entertain the hell out of you while we go on and run the world. I don't know. I might buy into that until election day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Next <laughs> question. Hi. Um, my name's Zeta Guzmanacha. Um, I'm wondering if YouTubers should be enforced the ch child marketing laws onto them because they're violating them by marketing uh, aggressively. And so, should they still have the same laws of how much time they should market to children and on TV? Hmm. Hmm. These, these are the issues, right? M maybe I mean. it's up to parents to police their own children and how much time they spend with... Mm. What? Yeah. yeah, I mean... I agree. It, just like TV or anything else. Yeah. D w I remember when DVDs were real popular from all, and, you know, parents... Don't just put the DVD on and let your child stare at that screen. You know, that was a big deal when I was thinking about having a child, and then I did, and then, of course, DVDs go away. And I, I, I don't know. I don't know that I, – I, mm, I don't know. <laughs> Do you want the government telling a really monopoly really. like YouTube, owned by Google? <laughs> by the way, that's uh, interesting. When I was talking, teaching this today, we were teaching about Google and YouTube. Their YouTube really doesn't have much competition. When you think about other video streaming, where you just go stream, you know, upload your own video and whatever. Vimeo, maybe is number two, a distant second. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, they're so dominant. I don't know what the, I wonder what the I wonder what the average daily upload content actually is. Like, how many hours worth of content oh. per day is now added to what is available? You know. 
That seems that's kind of daunting, huh? Five thousand hours per day. Holy crap! <laughs> this is the stuff. I'm so behind. We should be teaching w- <laughs> at school too. I must go watch things because we need to learn this stuff too. But this is the yeah. stuff kids need to think about when you talk about advertising and your resume is really your social media profile, mm-hmm. not a paper thing that you fill out and you know put your awards on. Because any job you're going to get, they're going to Google you. <laughs> Let's Hi, my name is Henley Queen. Hey. And do the Iowa caucuses unfairly change the minds of Americans since Iowa doesn't properly represent the U.S. with a 90% white population? Change their minds? I'm going to go no. Um, Unrepresentative of American population, of course. And should the Democrats change it? Absolutely. Um, I don't know. I think the first, the winner of the first primary, there might be a lot of people that would kind of go this way, but... Okay, they won that. Pro- okay, well, maybe, I don't know. That might actually have an effect, having that first victory under your belt. Now, uh, we've seen it happen, of course, where somebody wins Iowa and then they don't win the nomination. But yeah. um, I don't know. It might do I, once again, I don't know why we do it like this. I don't know why Iowa won the lottery and why they get to go first. I wonder if, they s- if there's going to be any repercussions for them bungling this primary process and them saying, okay, next 2020, we're, or 2024, we're going to somebody else. Right, well, I, yeah. I'll, let me jump in here, too, though. The idea that because it's a, a caucus as opposed to a primary, is it truly that 90% uh, white Americana that's actually participating in this, or is it actually more diverse than we think based on the way – because you know, if we're talking about cities – you know, those are obviously going to be more diverse than maybe out in the rural areas, like we see in a lot of parts of America. And so it might be more diverse than we than we think mm-hmm. if we just look at the state's overall population. But if we if I wonder, I, I would be interested to know, did they do any kind of statistics on the diversity factor in the actual caucus? Like that'd be an interesting s- thing to know. Right. Yeah I, I, yeah. I haven't seen them. I know they have them because some of the campaigns have been talking about their yeah. breakdowns already. Uh, but why I say no on the swaying Americans is because New Hampshire is second and they actually pride themselves on rejecting what Iowa did. Um, so they they do. They like to say, yeah, Iowa did this. They nominated this person, but we do things differently in New Hampshire, and that happened in 2016 as well. So Hillary Clinton wins the Iowa caucus and Bernie Sanders takes New Hampshire and the race is on. So that's my thought behind it because the, m- within a week, you've got another state going, yeah, but that's not how we do it. Who's uh, what? Who's third? Yeah. Uh, this go round, it's Elizabeth Warren at the moment. No, no, no I mean, uh, the third state. Third state. Oh, third state. Then uh, this year it's Nevada and then South Carolina. <laughs> Nevada, Nebraska, Indiana, all the diverse <laughs> states. <laughs> well, Nevada's got a better claim than Iowa. <laughs> that's true. I'm going to say about South that. Car- I'm saying South Alaska. Carolina would too. Yeah, South Carolina yeah. will too. Yeah. So. And then it's Super Tuesday. So. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Next question. My name's. Rhea Patel, and my question is, do you think that America's 21st century foreign policy could be classified as imperialist? Yes. Uh, it, but differently, you know, I mean, we, there's different rounds of imperialism that we see historically. If I think about sort of first rounds about European-mindedness branching out in the, you know, late 1400s, early 1500s, um, and then them trying to put you know, set up shop wherever they can, and then they find the Americas, and then they come up swarming over here. Uh, and then a, another round that happens in the early 1800s, and then another one in the l- in the mid to late 1800s. I, I don't know that it actually has ever ended. Maybe it's evolved in some way, in a, s- in a weird sense. I, I think the Philippines was the first real step, and I don't think we've looked back. Latin America, mm-hmm. we're assassinating people. We're yeah. I, I mean, we continuously are nation building or... But, I mean, it's different in the fact that we don't necessarily see hey, we're going to go and, like, you know, manhandle this entire country and force our way in necessarily. I mean, it does happen. But at the same time, we do have major political and economic control, and we do have military bases around the world. And so for people to deny that we're an empire, I just – that just seems – it seems silly to not admit it. The people that are suffering – you know, we talked to one of your buddies who was a Marine, right? Right. And he said, you know, the people, the Iraqi people that live day to day, they don't care anything about jihad or – they loved America being there. They had a little comfort and peace finally, worrying about the next extremist group to come in. And so, yeah, well, I mean, so imperialism, yes, but also 
it, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather it be us than... It doesn't <laughs> automatically make it negative. Right, exactly. That, and that's, yeah. I think in the past we could argue that it did. Uh, we misstep. Uh, we, we make mistakes. Like yeah. we, we blow up countries figuratively and literally mm-hmm. and, then, <coughs> and then go, oh, my God, the repercussions. And we didn't see that coming. Like that's, we, we could do a better job of, of being liberators and instead of you know, dropping freedom from 30,000 feet, we could actually go in there and try to build infrastructure and help people rule themselves. That would be great. And then we could be partners with them. That could still be considered imperialism, though, because you've, you're sort of interjecting yourself into other people's lives. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And we're always going to have other bad actors that are waiting to go into some of these weaker countries. Yeah. And, you know, so it's like the United States or we pull out and then. All right. Very good. Next question. Hi. Hi. My name is Ben Hollis. And last Thursdayism is the theory that the universe and all memories were created last Thursday. <laughs> Currently, there is no way to disprove or prove this. Why is this wrong or right? And how could you disprove it? I'm so glad I invited you to this, Ben. <laughs> what you said last Thursday? What about this Thursday? Today's Thursday. Yeah, All my memories are from this morning. <laughs> 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 All my things are heathens. I mean, possibly. So you can't prove or disprove <laughs> it. <laughs> I, you, okay, you have to explain that more. I've never heard this. Come back up to the mic and uh, t- <laughs> t- tell more about this whole process. Like, give give the give the rationale behind it don't scare him i finally convinced well, some freshmen no to come disprove <laughs> it you can't it's like oh well no c- but i mean I what what be be more specific it's about what, what it is Hello. what it is yeah. it's just like oh we i was just made when i was 14 and this month and this day i was just born today and everything in the past i didn't actually live through that that's just a memory and so everything started last thursday and we're just full of false memories yes what about next Thursday's last Thursday, which would be today? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let me take this in a slightly different path, but still tangential. Uh, we study something called existentialism, and part of that is the idea that you can't prove beyond your own understanding that anybody else actually exists at all. I think, therefore, I am. You, you know your consciousness, or at least your what seems to be an awareness factor there, but everything else might be an illusion. You don't know that I'm real. You can't prove, right? Because you can't understand the way I think. We're completely separate entities and beings, and, and so therefore the thought process, I, I can understand me, but I'll never be able to understand you thoroughly, right? Does that make sense? And so that's, I think it's a similar argument. All of this could be, let's go matrix on it. It all could be, <laughs> you know, some sort of digital illusion. I don't know. I don't know how you would. So could your self-conscious. Because you know, apparently, I've heard if you do enough LSD, we're all one. Everybody, <laughs> we're all connected. <laughs> so, um, a lot of Buddhists think that that we're actually just a one conscious, and you can actually lose your sense of self, like the self that you feel behind your eyes right now. We're all looking around. Yeah. There, it, you have an ability to kind of lose that. I've never lost it, <laughs> but apparently through years of meditation. How do you know? And or psychedelics. M- maybe you did last Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to smart people. Maybe that's it. Yeah. Uh, there are, you know, it, you ever study like disassociative disorders? Yeah. Where I, I read a thing Chop where, your hand yeah, up. people don't know. Like I've s- I read a thing where people can look in the mirror and not recognize the person. Like there's some some glitch somewhere inside the head where you go, who's that person following me around and why are they? You know, I get close to the mirror. Why are they mimicking me? Like there's that. So that that kind of thing can happen. So you might not even be a- able to control your own consciousness or your understanding of what you're seeing, right? Or, or um, like. Oh, here's a, oh, this came up the other day. Do you, when you, when you think to yourself, do you hear your voice or somebody else's? Have you ever thought of it that way? When you, when you think to yourself, do you hear you or do you hear somebody else? Is it a different voice in your head? Now in my head I'm going, is that me? (laughs) (laughs) Or, or, yeah, there's a, there's a group of people who don't, no, that's stupid. I just see words. Like, I don't hear voices. I see words flashing. Uh, and so, yeah. And this, is, but this was kind of my argument against free will, if there is an argument, <laughs> is like, do you even have control over that? Like, when a thought pops into your head, where does that thought come from? Are, do, are you making that happen? And mm. if not, who is? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. All well, right. I mean, you, didn't answer all the, you didn't answer my question. Which I, is, do I don't, you, 
do you hear yourself when you think to yourself? I do. I hear yeah, me. I think so. Right? And it depends on... I think I hear me. Until you hear myself on a recording, I'm like, I don't sound like that, do <laughs> I? If I think about what other people have said, then I hear their voice in my head. But if it's me talking to me, I hear me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No? Okay. I hear Barry White. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, Pretty good, it's like man. <laughs> a long time ago when my dad was still around, he would argue with me when I was a child that he goes, um, something about how, I don't know how it came up, but we was like, he was talking about dreaming. And he goes, well, you know, no, people don't dream in color because I said something about, oh, I had this really vivid dream. He's like, well, that's just your imagination. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, you don't dream in color. You just think you do. I go, it's all in my head. I know that I'm right. I consciously, subconsciously, but aware of the fact that I'm, I, and I do this. I have very brightly colored dreams sometimes, like s extreme blues and greens, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm aware of it in the dreams. I'm like, God, that's beautiful. And I'll wake up going, man, that was so cool. He goes, no, you're just sort of remembering it now. You weren't really experiencing it then, but I'm in real time. I was like, no. And he would argue with me. I'm like, how do you know what's in my head? <laughs> Jerk. I mean, <laughs> why would you say this to me? You know? Anyway, so, little side note. These are, these are deep thoughts. <laughs> All right. All right, next question. Oh, hello. It's kind of like a random question, but okay. it's like going off of what we were like learning recently. Um, if you could be any of like the main uh, Monopoly bosses, who would you be like going off of like Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, oh. Carnegie? Hmm. Like who would you like identify yourself as? Like who would you relate to the most? <laughs> I mean, I, this is, boy, those are, it's hard. If you just... <laughs> Thinking about how people thought and lived back then, we're a different species now. But I would want to be more like Carnegie, simply because he did at least give a lot of money away. He gave up his business when he didn't have to, uh, because he was tired of the corruption and the people strikes and all that. But I don't know. Rockefeller had the money. I mean, <laughs> so did Carnegie. Did, I mean, he was a. They ended up being philanthropists too, weren't? Didn't the Rockefeller family? Didn't they do some? I mean, not maybe as much as yeah. Carnegie, but I don't remember. Eventually, I mean, yeah. of course, he had grandchildren that were also in like Nelson Rockefeller. Yeah, yeah. They gave a lot, obviously, of their wealth. Yeah, the family itself is pretty philanthropic, but I don't think to the level of... To be these super rich guys, there's a certain mindset that you have to have, and giving yes. is not part of that equation usually. And yeah. That's what it's I was thinking. Take, 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 take. <laughs> it's hard to rewire to go, okay, I'll give yeah. some of this away. It's, I mean, just I think about the rich people. I mean, besides... I mean, even Bloomberg, okay. who's super rich, he's, he's given a bunch of money, but to his own benefit, trying, you know... It's like rich people that get that rich have spent a life. N they need more money. They just you know they'll they'll won't pay somebody here. It's just how much can they get in the bank? Mm -hmm. It seems to be now there there's exceptions of course to everything, but it is interesting. Uh, but I don't know if those those dudes. Yeah, I don't even know if I can put myself in the mindset for it honestly because it feels like it's it would be such a rewiring and then go. Okay, that's how I'd be. I, I don't even know. I would want to be any of the rags to riches like Rockefeller. Oh, Carnegie. that's a good point. I don't want to be born like Vanderbilt's son, born into wealth. You know how rich kids are. Um, I would want to be self-made. At least you have that. That you 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 know what it's like to be broke and scared and and you've built yourself up. Um, I would want that. Do that you think that Carnegie gave that money away because he cared about people, or he was trying to buy his way into heaven, some sort of penance? Maybe. It's hard to judge what other people's intentions are. I just, but I'm curious, you know, because he did spend his early life just cutthroat businessman, that robber baron mentality. Screw everybody. I'm making money. Right? Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. It's what about, say. what about, uh, who's, who's the newspaper boy? Hearst? Hearst, yeah. Yeah. That dude, super influential. He never we don't have time for a history lesson on Hearst, but we'll he never, he up. never, as far as I know, went down that path of, oh, I need to help people with my money, did he? Or was it always about him? No, I mean, that's marijuana being illegal. Like, everybody just grows up in a world where it's illegal. He started it. He's the one who didn't want to switch all his paper factories to hemp because it would have cost him so much. He already had them wired for wood, pulp. So he, you know, he created this basically yellow journalism around how horrible... And I'm not promoting marijuana. I'm just saying this. He he coined it. He, he's the one who came up with that term, exotic marijuana that makes people reefer, crazy. Reefer madness. And yeah, the <laughs> government with prohibition just passed out. Yep, none yeah. of that either. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know who I would be because it's so foreign. Honestly, uh, I think that having that kind of money would probably 
change people. You ever seen those shows? It's like, oh, the lottery ruined my life. You know, <laughs> I was this nice guy, and then I got rich, and I went up the deep end. You know, oh, yeah. would you want that kind of wealth and fame? I don't, I don't know that I would ever want that. And I wouldn't want to say any, I want to be, like, I just thought, well, you know, Henry Ford voluntarily raised the minimum, uh, the wage, raised the wages of his factories to keep them happy. And then I thought, oh, he's anti-Semitic. Don't want to be him. <laughs> All right, who's right, next? Yeah. <laughs> Who else can I be? All these people are going to have, you know, look, at, if you're born yeah. during that time, you're going to be a little. Uh, Pro and con. Yep. <laughs> All right. Come on up. Hi, I'm Lauren Boston, and my question is, so Pumphrey mentioned Twitter today in class, and I wanted to know how you guys feel about, like, the creator trying to have a filtered and unfiltered Twitter. Yeah, I heard that uh, he, he's so torn with this, because, you know, he, these, they have to make these decisions, who gets banned, who doesn't, why, and they have these terms of service, and so you, you got like these gray areas. Are you suggesting that he's, I don't know, I'm not familiar with this, so he's, like, saying that there's going to be a Twitter safe zone? And then there's going to be a Twitter well, gonna be free normal, for all. Normal yeah, Twitter, kind of like and then the Wild want. West. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then okay. anything goes. Mm. Yeah. And so you have an option if you want to take the chance of getting banned and all that. Well, uh, then where where do you start making those divisions? Because somewhere in that safe zone, somebody's going to be like, I got my feelings hurt. And you have to do another one, and then another one, and then another one. Yeah. Like, where does that end, honestly? Also, when there's no filter, they already try this with something else. It's similar to Twitter, Gab something. And it's it's there's no limits. You do what you want to do, and they said it's just repulsive. People just spewing out the worst that humans can think of just to do it, just because it's there. I can do it. Hmm. Uh, I, yeah, it's, I don't think it's gonna work. Um, uh, it's it's but you, who steps in the government? I mean, these are weird. Yeah, yeah, that's my concern with that because I definitely don't want the government in it. Uh, but do I think they have some sort of social responsibility? Probably. But I don't know where you draw that line. We're in the progressive movement. We're if you're, if you're advocating you know, violence against certain groups or any, any group, as a matter of fact, then I mean, th- shouldn't that be a thing where you go, um, you probably don't need to be on here for a while. You know, you're going to get a timeout. Yes, but, th- but there's I mean, I so much gray area. So it I'm, d- t- I'm talking about direct <laughs> threats. Yeah, that kind so, of so thing, that yeah. would be the same freedoms that people have on the street. You can, as long as right. you're not inciting violence. And, but there's so much else that can go on that it doesn't necessarily incite violence but it's just horrific, because just you know? because you're offensive doesn't mean that you need to be mm, restricted if you're actually trying to advocate for someone's demise or, or bodily harm you know then that maybe that's where we have to look at something well, all the banning and stuff on twitter it's hurting the right mainly the left seems to be able to if they could not kick out their own people they seem to be able to navigate this space a little better but it's pretty, I don't know, pretty dicey. Yeah, it's tr- it's <laughs> tricky for sure. I'm yeah. glad I don't have to make those decisions. Right. But I do think freedom of speech in this area is going to be, it's going to keep going for years and years. So Did you have a follow up? So I was going to try and figure out like if you don't think that it, if you think it should be censored, who should censor it? Should it be the owner or should it be like who do you expect that power to go to? I, as long as it's a private company, I think they have a board. They make their decisions. You don't like it. You don't have to use their platform. That's true. You don't have to be on no. there. The only thing, of course, is some of these platforms are so large. There's nothing. Like Twitter is its its own thing, and there's nothing quite like it. You say, oh, well, Facebook. Well, Instagram. It's yeah, true, but s- Twitter is its own thing as far as that certain conversation politically. So, you know, some of these people, their whole careers are there, mm-hmm. and then all you take that from them and – over something that's maybe c- considered trivial, but I still think as much as possible leave it in their hands. Uh, yeah, I think I think the let them let them police it themselves. Just you know, once once government gets involved, it gets a little trickier for sure. I think. So we'll talk when we get into World War One and talk about what. F- and hi- hopefully, this guy right here will help out with uh, Shank versus U.S. and like what is freedom of speech, what's acceptable, what's. A- they had to figure that out in wartime. Like, what can you do? Even if you're not inciting violence, is there still limits on your speech? And so we'll, I'm still trying to figure a lot of that out. Yep. Excellent. All right, come on. Okay. So in your opinion, what is the most influential piece of non-religious text in history? And, like, why? Uh, Newton Principia, because it started modern science. What's it? Yeah, uh, in in all of human history, non-religious. Text. I mean, the four laws of motion, the uh, uh, calculus. This, it has to be a writing by Newton, Newton in my book, just because it that's that's where we kick off modern 
it's non-religious, although he was religious and, uh, and just crazy little. Knee-jerk answer, Communist Manifesto. Um, That's interesting. The, the, the identification in uh, of, of the proletariat oh, of as a as a group of people and what you should do to help them. I mean, that's right. It's a pamphlet more than it is a book, obviously. But at the same time, the idea that it's time to organize and do something about this horrendous set of conditions that more and more people are falling victim to. I think. I mean, I think it's a game changer. I, w I would also throw out there probably um, Descent of Man. You know, Darwin. Although that has religious implications, for sure. But yeah. well, but not by him necessarily. Yeah, right. Yeah, as a so. reaction, I, I agree with that too. That's a big one. I still, basic physics. Our modern physics comes from Newton. I just think that, for me, that gives us everything. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Newton's a good answer. Yeah. Well, I could be wrong. But that <laughs> wealth of nations comment has my brain spinning ah, because that's. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a good. That's can, a good. I one can too. go so many ways off of that, but. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Next. We're probably missing an obvious <laughs> one. <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh, I'm Jason Long, and um, I was wondering what your takes were on the conflict going on between the U.S. and Iran. So. Which one? Uh, the, the recent you know, <laughs> stuff going on. With the passenger plane being shot down um, and us having killed their second command, their general. So. Oh, my Lord. Uh, we talked a little bit about, because this was going on, I think, in the last podcast, maybe we touched yeah. on this. We a little bit, yeah. It seems, of course, I'm kind of out of it. I'm trying to move. I have no time. I have kids. I'm not even, I'm barely paying attention. When, but when it, to oh me, so just an average person not really paying super close attention, uh, it seems to have died down quite a bit. Like, what, do you a what are you asking? What do we think about it? I mean, do you have a pointed question in that, or not really, just, what your just general thoughts? Yeah. Uh, it's, it, we've had... We've had really strained relations with them most of the time that we've had relations with them, honestly. You know, we can take that all the way back to the early 1900s when we uh, helped them dig oil out of their uh, out of the ground, you know, and, and, and build infrastructure that we then controlled. And I can see why they would be resentful over our, yeah. go back to the imperialism story, um, the, the, inter the interference in their elections in the 50s, you know, uh, the, the reinstallation of the Shah, um, the... the the modern conflict that we see really sort of the, the, the butting of heads. I mean, like we're not in full conflict with them, obviously. By proxy, we are in places like Yemen, you know, if we, if we follow that civil war scenario between them and the Saudis. And anyway, uh, but go back to the 79 revolution, you know, the Ayatollah and, and the taking of the hostages. And then I was trying to figure out how we're going to to balance that equation now that it's gone in their favor. And, and you know, we, we have lost really major influence there major sanctions against the country. We're trying to cripple them economically and politically and so that their own people will rise up against them basically is the idea. Is it going to happen? At times we see people take to the streets, but it's never really been this major push to have revolutionary change like they did in 79. So I, I think that we're ultimately, <laughs> I, I don't know how you erase more than 100 years worth of, you know, really crappy politics and, and interference I think that we would like to, as a nation, if I think about just people's reaction, we, we don't hate the Iranian people any more than they hate us, but we would like to see them have a democratic process that then leads them to have more freedoms, and we want, to, we want them to look like us, and we want them to, I don't mean like individual people, but I mean as far as our, our, our ability to voice ourselves and to have uh, less censorship and more voting rights, and especially for women, and you know, uh, they, we would like for them to kind of go back to the pre-revolutionary days and, and give more rights and privileges that were in place, because it was more westernized. But at the same time, we fail to recognize their religious, um, the religious viability, and they're not going to be us as much as we would like that to be a thing. And so what do they want? I think that we would be better served to help them help themselves as opposed to just crushing them to make them do what we want to do. I just think it's a bad plan. All right, very good. Next question. Hi. Hi, my name is Mari Four, and Ooh. I was just, uh, I was just wondering... Why does it seem like older generations think that teenagers just don't know how to read or don't know what a book is? Because um, I always thought that was weird. Um, I don't think that, because I teach advanced kids and they read a lot more than I did when I was a kid. Um, maybe because we don't see physical books as much. There's a lot of people reading. Mm -hmm. I bet on average kids today read way more than when I was a kid. 
Because if you didn't have a book in your hand, you weren't reading. Mm -hmm. There was no phone, news. There was no internet, really. So I, I would assume kids are exposed to more and probably read more than we did. It I was a TV generation. We, we yeah, that, that was the argument about our, yeah, we just plopped down and, you know, we're just watching TV 24 hours a day. Well, no, I take that back. It wasn't, there wasn't TV 24 hours a day when I was a kid. It was, you know, it went off at 11 or 12 and you got static for a good, you know, hours overnight and then it came back on in the morning because FCC wouldn't allow it. Um, but yeah, the idea that we were rotting our brains with TV and then video games came along and we were the first generation to have those as well. I mean, not to the same degree that you guys have uh, content-wise, but still, you know, I played I played a lot of Centipede and Pac-Man, and you know, and they were like, "Why aren't the kids reading? Why can't Johnny read?" It's been I don't know that every generation yeah, seems to do that. Yeah, and and I I will guarantee you that when you guys get older and the the new group comes up, on it, you'll be like, "Oh my God, these children are out of control!" Like, I mean, it, ha I, it I don't know, it's sort of an old person thing to do. It's All they do is levitate. All that just <laughs> levitating around, walking <laughs> through walls. We didn't walk through walls. Who needs that? <laughs> yeah, I. I don't know. Maybe it's just bias and resentment because you don't do things the way that they did, you know? It, but you that doesn't mean that I think every generation kind of goes through that where the older group looks at them and goes, "Well, you're just lazy." And I mean, I think there's some of that, you know? I, I don't have an answer beyond that, really. Okay, we can do one quick question if anybody else has anything else. Anybody else? All right. Oh, okay. The last on. question is coming to the mic. Once again, thank you to Collective Coffee for having us out once again. Indeed. And the last question. All right. Hi, my name is Mary Labby. There is a quote that I keep seeing, and I kind of want your opinion on it. It says, why are teenagers so dang angry? And the answer that is said is because they are treated like children and expected to act like adults. Hmm. 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 I don't agree with that necessarily. Um... Teenager is actually a modern concept <laughs> that was invented when people were able to get an education through high school. And they had this weird period. Instead of going to work at 12, getting married at 14 and 15, starting a family. Dying at 36. Yeah. So as life got easier, you know, I, I do think because when it, no matter, you go back to any previous generation, physically it was harder. You were getting up. You were doing more walking, more. Everything you had to do, you were walking. You were. It's, it was just more physical stuff. I mean, especially here. We go from a seated position here to a seated position in our car to a seated position at home and repeat. We're not out on the farm every day. We're not, we don't have a garden that we're helping our parents with. I think it's easier to – I really think it's easier to get angry when you're not physically active. I think there's – science to that it, like if it, have you ever been like in your head and you just you're angry you don't know what to do about something and then you go work out and it completely kind of rewires you to like oh that's not that big of a deal I think there's something to that you know when you have an easier life it's you're um, you're more emotional or something maybe I don't know if that's true maybe the downtime gives you more time to reflect on how you wish you could be your own person making your own decisions I th I th there's this I'll, I'll counter that quote with another sort of thought that ch children, I think at the beginning, it, uh, and I'm making generalities here, like you look up to adults in your life and then there comes a point in time where you judge them and then maybe that judgment leads to resentment and that could lead to the anger because I, they aren't going to see life the way that you do and they don't experience it the same way you do and they may have expectations on you that you don't wish to fulfill anymore. And you have to figure out how to be yourself in that context. And I think that modern concept of teenage, like that's that moment where you're trying to figure out what it is you're going to do. Whereas before, that may have been controlled for you. You're born in this group. You're going to do this, and that's just a given. Now you have some decisions that you can make, but it's, it's delayed. The, the decision-making process is we're going to say, well, we want you to make decisions, but not yet. And there's some frustration in that, and I wonder if that leads to some of the angst that we see. And I think that resentment at that age – for both works both ways. It's like a dual resentment street. Yeah. Um, that that would be my guess on that. But I think any transition in life too, where you're becoming an adult but you're not quite there, to then getting married, the first year of marriage, first two years, you're adjusting to that life. Then you have kids, you adjust to that, and then you don't have kids and they go away, and then you, you have that t adjustment. I think all these adjustments are something that people. That's part of being 
who we are. Ha- having now reached the point in life where I have adult children, the hope that I have is that we have been able to help them become strong, independent people who think for themselves. And hopefully that we have enough in common now that we can be friends. And I don't mean that in like, well, I'm going to love everything that you do or whatever. And right. I d- we want to be friendly with each other and be peers more than I mean, I'm still your parent and I, st- right, I still have certain expectations. But at the same time, I've got to accept you as an adult. And I don't know that everybody can do that or do, uh, do it well. That's what I'm working on. I want us to have that relationship moving forward. I hope that that'll be that case, right? But we, we'll wait and see. So that when they have teenagers that are mad at them, they'll know how <laughs> to deal with it. And I can look at it and go, and the cycle now continues. you know. Now you know. All right, guys. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank Collective you. Coffee. That we are History After Hours. Good night.